Um, now is the portion of the agenda that we really look forward to at every school wellness summit. It's when we've celebrated over the past decade, we've done this since the first summit. It's the work that you all are doing each and every day in your schools. In this segment, we're gonna celebrate some of the work that is happening in three of our local school communities. Each will provide us with a lightning presentation to highlight one wellness initiative in their school district. First, we will learn from Goleta Union School District and Inner Explorer. I would like to welcome to the stage, Abby Vasquez, the Director of Pupil Services, Goleta Union School District, and the lead at the district for the Wellness Committee. Gloria uh, is a teacher at Goleta, and uh, their partner is Lisa Grady, the Chief Strategy Officer with Inner Explorer, a mindfulness program platform uh, designated to support mental health and well-being in schools. Lisa works with districts throughout California, including, including LAUSD, Goleta Union, Chula Vista, who's here with us today, San Bernardino, just to name a few. Uh, and they support the social, emotional, and behavioral well-being of their school communities. Welcome up to the stage. Mike, Mike, Mike. Yep. Whatever works for you. Can everyone hear me? I just feel so genuinely grateful to be here with all of you and to be included in this celebration. I've just been so impressed and in awe of the dedication and the commitment that you all so clearly demonstrate and the passion, I would say. It's more than work for you all. It's really a calling. And yesterday, I believe it was Kate who asked us for our why. And I actually gave a fairly general response. It was really to address the growing youth mental health crisis so that all of our students can reach their full potential. But I have a story that I think really illustrates my why even more. We recently heard about a third grader who was having a great amount of difficulty in school this past year. Um, he was acting out a lot. He was very reactive. Uh, he was having trouble getting along with his classmates and just very uh, dysregulated in the classroom. They started using the Inner Explorer program, which I'll tell you a little bit about in shortly. And within about two weeks, um, they started to notice a difference for this young boy. But one day he was starting to get into a conflict with a student and the teacher was watching, and she saw that he paused, he took some intentional breaths, and then he walked up to her and he said, I'm not okay. And to have that level of awareness at such a young age was really incredible. And so the teacher stopped and was able to listen, as we heard earlier, the importance of listening. And she engaged in a deeper conversation with him. But what's really compelling to me is that as they were having this discussion, the other children one by one started getting out of their chairs and circling around this young boy. And they too wanted to engage in that conversation. So it ended up being a circle time about handling big emotions and some strategies to handle those. So that's really just one of the very many stories that we get on a personal level that really make up my why. I've been in the mindfulness field for over 30 years, um, and I just felt such an important need when I worked mostly with adults originally in the corporate environment, also in healthcare. I would hear from them consistently, I really wish I had these when I was younger. And I actually helped uh, teach the co-founder of Inner Explorer, and that started me on my journey working in mindfulness and education about 11 years ago. Moving forward, so we are a mindfulness-based social-emotional learning program, and we recognize that just like this young boy, our students really are struggling. Toxic stress um, is really fueling the mental health crisis, and there are a variety of reasons for these, some that have been decades in the making, maybe even longer. Generational poverty, racial inequity, some of our political divisiveness, of course, the pandemic, the climate anxiety. And we're seeing that about 80% of students are now reporting being chronically stressed. 22% of high school students are reporting suicidal ideation. And one in three children or adolescents will have an anxiety disorder by the time they are 18. 
it's actually hard for me to see these. <laughs> so 78% of our educators are also reporting chronic stress. And about 63% of them have considered leaving the profession, which would be a real shame. And 33%, and we're seeing this across the nation, are reporting increases of both physical and verbal threats to their well being. And sadly, 29% of this also is coming from parents and caregivers. Thank you, that's so kind of you. <laughs> so we know, I'm just gonna go very briefly into the neuroscience. We'll be going into this more during the workshop tomorrow, as well as giving you a more experiential sense of the work that we're doing. But we know that stress really shuts down thinking and learning, and it leads to harmful brain development. So it really shrinks actually the brain's capacity and we're finding that our students are really stuck in this fight, flight, freeze um, reactivity. And this is escalating the mental health disorders. So they're showing up to schools, place where they're wanting to learn often, but they're dysregulated, they're unfocused, they're reactive, and they're suffering with anxiety and depression. But there is hope. So daily mindfulness has been found to be an antidote. So there's over 40,000 um, or 40 years of research on the efficacy of mindfulness across all domains, including healthcare, the military, education, uh, athletics, and entertainment. And there's over 10,000 published studies. The majority of the studies are based on the mindfulness-based stress reduction protocol, which is really viewed as the gold standard in mindfulness. And what they are pointing to is that when daily practice takes place, the nervous system calms down, um, the mind-body connection is strengthened, and it really begins to create those healthier brain connections as well as improving resilience. So a mindful brain will tend to be more focused, attentive, engaged, connected, compassionate, empathetic, so these are just the physical and mental health um, advantages of practicing mindfulness, but also we know in working with wanting to promote the whole child that we're also looking at the social and emotional behavioral health as well. And I won't go into any detail on these, we're doing a lightning presentation, so. <laughs> so just a few facts about our program. So it's very simple. We recognize the uh, environment that we're trying to do this work in. We're very intentional about doing it in education because that's where students are every day. And we know that when you just start using an app or something like that, that it's very hard to get consistent habit out of it. So we've created this with an educator advisory council. And we have five to 10 minute practices. So it's a just press play model. There is no prep, no curriculum, no planning. It's sequenced to the school year. So there's 180 days worth of practice, pre-K through 12th grade. We're very intentional about the messaging that we do. We're culturally responsible, responsive. Um, we also have diverse narrators in both age, ethnicity, gender, geographically, so that students can really hear voices like themselves, but also different from themselves and we're available in English and Spanish. So we've made it so it's very scalable and easy to implement in a district. We have randomized controlled studies on our program that demonstrate a 43% reduction in teacher stress. The model in our program is that educators practice along with the students so that every day they're attending to their own well-being at the same time. We often hear that it's kind of their favorite time of the day because it's the only time of the day that they really can pause and, and take a break. And then 60% improved classroom behavior. So we had one case study in a continuation high school where they actually were using restraints and seclusions and just those terms alone make me very sad. And they went from 180 down to 60 in one year. But what really inspired me the most was when, when the students returned to their typical classrooms was that they were then really seen with fresh eyes. Their natural gifts began to emerge when they weren't overshadowed by their behavior. So the artist emerged, the writer, the songwriter, um, the mathematician. 
And of course, we know that when you can attend to the underlying stress, and we like to say biology before behavior, when you can attend to the behavior and when students can be attentive and focus and take in all the wonderful learning that's taking place, that there will be gains in academics. And so there's also anywhere from a 15 to 28% increase in academic performance. And before I turn it over to my friends here, to Gloria and Abby, I just really want to acknowledge the incredible partnerships that we've been able to forge, and that makes the work even more meaningful for me. And I, um, we've been working with Galita since 2019, and I didn't know Peggy was going to be here, but I did acknowledge her in my slide. <laughs> but she really was the one that helped get us into um, Galita Union School District, and she's been an incredible advocate of the program. And then also, I want to thank Abby in being the lead in the administration and, and the district, as well as Gloria, who's one of our champions. And we find, as been, has been mentioned so many times here, that having a champion of a program makes all the difference in the world. So we've grown organically from a few schools um, to the entire district. And as was mentioned earlier, we're in districts all over California. We have a much larger job to do in LAUSD, um, but we're seeing incredible growth and engagement there as well. So I will turn it over. Okay, so it looks like I am next. <laughs> I'm Abby Vasquez. I'm Director of Pupil Services for Goleta Union School District. And um, I'm just coming on one year in that position. And previously, I was uh, site principal for uh, two or three of our elementary schools there. One was a one year, kind of was a blip. Um, so let me get us to the. I was just going to present a very quick overall how Galita happened to fall into Inner Explorer and how that has been one of those happy things that ended up well for all of us, um, both students and staff alike. And uh, as alluded to earlier, it really was thanks to Peggy Grossman, who was one of our school psychologists at one of our sites. and. Um, this began as a pilot, just offered anybody who is interested in our teaching crew, if they wanted to find out more and see about piloting this in their classroom. And we ended up with four school sites that had two or three teachers in primary and intermediate grades who decided that year to take that on. and. This is one of those um, Tom Sawyer and the fence sort of opportunities. Uh, those teachers, and I believe Gloria was actually among that group, um, took that on. And through their own excitement, it grew. So they talked about it at staff meetings. They presented about it at the staff meetings. They demonstrated and had sample um, mindfulness activities at the staff meetings. And that worked so well that the following year, the four schools that had those teachers piloting decided as a school site they would pilot. And the commitment was you will do this once a week in your classroom, um, a very low ask. It's, again, about five minutes up to 10 minutes for some of the longer lessons, but typically right in that five minute range. Um, even though there is a lesson every day when we were piloting, we really just wanted that commitment of you will try this <laughs> one time a week. Um, and really, it grew exponentially right away. Um, people were definitely finding that this was a time investment that was worth it. They could have those kiddos, any of you who've taught elementary school know that coming in from lunch recess break can oftentimes be about five or 10 minutes of trying to have 
children re-regulate and get ready to learn again. Um, and even then there will be spikes and there will be a lot of bubbles that don't completely flatten out. And coming in and having an activity like this made that afternoon, which could have been some learning, maybe not optimal learning, into something that was really rich and meaningful for all of the kids. Um, so it's that investment that totally pays off. Uh, after that year, <clears throat> With the pilot, again, nothing sells better than success. And as teachers all know, that teachers' favorite thing to do is to do what other teachers are finding successful. So as word of this spread, we did adopt. Ironically, we adopted right in the spring of 2020. As we all know, that kind of does some interesting things. Um, the one thing that is one uh, was a great fit for an immediate entrance into the Zoom world is you can do this on Zoom. <laughs> and for families and children who were dysregulated in their home environment, stressed out by all of the things that were going on, this was actually a practice that was helpful and we shared not only with our students and with our staff, but with families. And families were accessing this together as well. So it ended up being, even though we thought, okay, are we really gonna just continue forward with this? It, it was the right thing to do and we ended up, it, it was wonderful. So the following year we did, as many people did, a hybrid of um, some children were still being educated at home, some were getting ready to come back. We maintained and kept through with this. And I would say at this point in time, um, while we do have the once a week commitment so that the language is there, many, many of our classrooms are implementing this daily and it really is a staple in our whole social emotional learning. Um, we do have social emotional learning. I'm seeing that um, my screen is half cut off, but you can read the infer the rest there. Um, it is part of our whole package and it is a vital piece. So we do have school-wide PBIS systems in place. We have adopted second step as a curriculum for social emotional learning. Um, we use the inner explorer mindfulness on a regular basis. And we also have um, last year begun uh, using the DESA as a social emotional screener, uh, which all of these things strengthen each other. It's not any one of these is like, oh, this is the answer. Uh, but altogether, it ends up being something that is is cohesive and strong and really, I think, shows our district and our teachers' commitment to social emotional well-being of our kiddos. Uh, as a principal, I, I was always eager to say, oh yes, there are absolutely academic benefits to this. Children who are regulated are able to learn new things. And that is completely 100% always the case. And not only able to learn, but excited about learning, open to learning, having just being in a space where new information can come in. It, that also helped us with an, a big sell for some of our families and for some of our teachers. I don't have time for that. Well, really, you're going to end up getting that time back because of the ability of children to be on task or listening to what you are saying. And that was it. Flash, flash version. <laughs> I'm going to stand because I'm not used to sitting. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. My name is Gloria Eno. I am currently a third grade teacher with Goleta Union, and I have been with Goleta Union for 27 years. I've taught grades. Woo! <laughs> I've taught grades K through three, and I've had a couple of combination classes uh, mixed in there as well. And I currently teach at La Patera Elementary School. It's where both of my kids graduated from. I love it there. Um, and so we'll just get started. This is actually me in my classroom. And I actually have that quote in my classroom, everything is figureoutable. 
And so we're seeing so many statistics and so many percentages. And I'm just here to tell you that everything is going to be OK. <laughs> because I'm in the trenches, and I'm in the classroom, and I'm with the kids all day. And I feel like I have the best job in the whole world, because I know that once I see my first student, it doesn't matter if it's my student or if it's a student from another classroom, um, a student that I've had previously, or a student who I've never had. Once I'm on campus and I see my first student, I know everything is going to be OK. Everything's going to be OK that day, and everything will be OK in our world. Everything will be OK, so trust me. Um, and so everything is figure outable. Thank you. So I'm here to tell you how I do Inner Explorer in my classroom and why teach mindfulness awareness in my classroom. Um, so as Lisa was saying that as human beings, we all have really big emotions. And what I teach my students is that we practice mindfulness awareness because we all have big emotions and we don't want to do or say something that we will regret um, as a result of those big emotions. So we want to learn how to pause, take some deep breaths, have some positive self-talk and actually learn how to calm our brains down so that we can react to stressful situations in a helpful way. So remaining calm in stressful situations is super important because we know that when we get angry or frustrated, we know that the cortisol is running through our body and prolonged um, exposure to cortisol is not healthy for our bodies. Um, we want to react in helpful ways, and um, we also want to pay attention to our thoughts and emotions, being aware of our surroundings. And um, what I love about Inner Explorer is that um, in the beginning of our sessions, uh, they do teach kids the physical brain structure and how we want to, how we actually have the power to um, expand our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that helps us to think and stay calm and make rational decisions based on critical thinking. So um, this is my, oh, can you just go back real quick? This is my current classroom. And as Kara was saying, this is, I, I, I would rather go to school on my deathbed rather than write sub plans and have to be absent. I do not like to be absent. And this is their first sub of the year. And so I'm really missing them. And I have to say that I've been glancing at my watch thinking, oh, this is what they're doing now. Oh, this is OK. They just finished. They're at their specialist now. And so I'm really missing them. And I can't wait to get back to my kids. But I'm so glad to be here. Um, so one of the practices that we use is called the shark fin practice. And it's just basically putting the hand down the head. And that physical movement just tells the body that it's time to calm down and we're going to be practicing our mindfulness awareness. Okay, go ahead. So we've so I always reiterate to my kids that um, we've all felt stressed, hurt, angry, worried, um, lonely, sad. Those are natural human emotions. And so how can we react to them? But let's use instead of reacting in a way that we might regret, let's use our inner explorer to build our mindfulness. So we have the words and the thoughts. OK, so for example, when I say words and thoughts, um, a lot of times on our Inner Explorer, we'll say, before we get started, we'll say, I have the power to make wise choices, or I have the power to make kind choices. And also, what kind of thoughts are you thinking? I tell my kids, you know, don't be your own bully. Life is hard enough. Let's actually practice the words and the vocabulary to help us be resilient. Like, I can do this. I believe in myself. Um, we all make mistakes. Mistakes are learning opportunities. And you have to teach that to the kids because a lot of times what we as humans revert to is something very negative, And we want to give them positive self-talk. Um, breathing and calming, what I teach my students is that deep breathing. We do a lot of deep breathing practice in the classroom, especially um, you know, if there's been something out on the playground that's happened, I might do it with my whole class or I might just do it with an individual student. But just um, the actual act of deep breathing actually calms, um, calms down your body. And science has actually proven that people who regularly deep breathe actually live longer. 
Um, and then posture and movement. We pay attention a lot to our posture. Are we slouching or are we sitting up straight? And just being aware that when we sit up straight that we feel more confident about ourselves. So my takeaway is, is that we want our kids to learn how to make wise, kind choices. And we also want them to be confident. We want them to feel like when life brings stress to them, whether they ask for it or not, we want them to feel confident in knowing that they have the tools to deal with that. And also to have happier relationships because life is all about having happier, positive relationships. So, and this is what it looks like in my classroom. So I do it every day after lunch and um, it's 10 minutes or less per session, and that includes journaling. And these are some of the features that I love. And what I've also loved about Inner Explorer is that, as Lisa said, that they do have educator, um, what do you call them, Advi an advisory council. So this year, I've seen a lot of fantastic improvements to Inner Explorer that I love. Um, like, I love that they have student narrators now, and they introduce the narrators at the beginning of Inner Explorer, and they look like regular kids, just like them. Um, and I also like the fact that the, in that the narrators introduce themselves, so they just feel like real people, like my students actually have a connection to these narrators. Um, it also explains the brain science behind our big emotions. I'm really liking that. And then there's also several introductory sessions. So instead of going straight into, okay, let's start our mindfulness awareness, because for most of the kids, this is the first time they've ever done it. And so there's several introductory sessions on why it's beneficial. Um, and then the new narrators um, feel very accessible, and there's lots of different um, racial backgrounds and lots of different voices and lots of different um, I would say, and lots of different ages, like there are more older narrators, which I'm very much appreciating. So thank you for your advisory council. Um, so these are some examples of the journaling that my students have done this year. And this is what some of my students have said, uh, they've written. So my favorite sense is sight, because I wouldn't be able to see all the beautiful things like flowers and colorful pictures. Um, stretching feels loose. Her voice makes me feel tired, and they were responding to the narrator. Okay, what's the next one? Um, I felt nice, TBH, which is to be honest, because you know, all, all, I don't correct any of the spelling, I don't correct anything in their inner explorer writing. So TBH, um, it was calming, really nice, and I had calm thoughts, <laughs> but I thought that was really cute. Um, so Inner Explorer takes less than 3% of my, you know, six and a half hour day to make a 100% difference. So daily practices. So students, what students know is that, um, that I'm aware and I care about their stress levels. I think that's really important to acknowledge with to the kids that I understand that they are under stress. Um, and we, there are things that we can do to combat that. Um, creating a classroom climate that is calm and also fun, persevering, kind, and teamwork oriented. And these are all things that once you start doing Inner Explorer, or even it could be your own mindfulness awareness practice that you do at home, which I do every morning. So what I do is every morning before I get to work, I do my own personal mindfulness awareness practice so that I'm focused and I'm centered and I'm calm. And it doesn't matter what comes my way. I know that it's figure outable. Um, so, and also students learning to remain calm during tests. You, because the reality is, is that we do have monthly tests that we have to take and we have a lot of checkpoints and things like that. And so just teaching them how to remain calm during those tests. Um, and then office referrals remaining low, low to none. I'm very blessed. Um, I just, I just don't have a whole lot of um, behavior issues. You know, not knock on wood. But I mean, I have a regular classroom. I have the 504s. I have the IEPs. Um, you know, I have you know kids who have problems that you know they bring in from the home. You know, but what when you do your mindfulness awareness practice, whatever they come in with. They, they can bring it in and then we can learn how to manage it. And they know that everything's gonna be okay. 
Um, so I just, I feel so lucky that, I feel so honored that I'm the person that gets to help the kids realize that and uncover those superpowers that they have within them already. Um, and then, and that results in more learning because I don't have to spend time managing um, my kids. And so last year, and also this year too, they're fantastic, but um, last year I had, I, on my behavior chart, I only, there was only one time when I ever had to um, actually, uh, I would say take what I have is they're either on green or off green, and there was only one time that I had to take my student off of green. But what I think is really important is that we don't just do the inner explorer for five minutes, and then the rest of the day, we don't do any mindfulness awareness. It's just something that I practice on my own. I bring it into my classroom, and I tell my students that I'm their six and a half hour cheerleader. I am their six hour cheerleader, and I am there for them all day. Um, this is me during, oh, can you go back again real quick? So this, so the bottom picture is this is me um, during the pandemic. And actually during the pandemic, that is when I increased my own personal mindfulness awareness and my own personal um, running and my own personal working out and whatever I needed to do to stay positive. So this is me in my bedroom classroom. And so I, that was my classroom. And so I made my poster in the back by my bedroom window. Um, the middle picture shows what my classroom looked like before my students came back from the pandemic and, um, you know, six feet of distancing, plexiglass, um, hand sanitizing, windows, doors open all day. It was like the whole nine yards. Um, and then on the dome right there, that's my class that I Zoomed with for most of the year. And then they came back and a lot of people said, you know, there's no way that you're going to connect with your kids through Zoom. It's not going to happen. And we defied the odds. And they're the, um, they're the class that I still, I still, we still exchange holiday cards. Um, and I've been writing to them at the end of each year. So it's, um, so it can, it can happen. So you know, a lot of it is that you have to ignore the distractions. There's a lot of distractions in life and you just have to ignore it. Um, okay, so why begin? So I love teaching. Like I said, I have the best job in the world and I want to continue to love it until my final day, until I retire. I just, I want to love it. I don't want to have a job that I go to that I don't love. Um, I strive to cultivate the passion that brought me to this profession. And so I just want to keep cultivating that and I know that I can. And um, I want to be the role model that my students follow. So I don't want to just be the teacher who says, oh, let's do this for five minutes. But then the rest of the day, they're wondering, well, what happened to those messages that you said five minutes ago? It's like, I want it to just embody our whole classroom culture. And mindfulness awareness practice makes it possible for me to do what I love because I've told my students to come back and visit one day and, and they do. So that is Adrian on, um, on the far left, so that's Adrian, and he was with me in first grade, and um, he actually drove down from Fresno, and he, well, he, he just appeared in my classroom after school one day, and I totally remembered him. He drove down from Fresno. We talked for a couple hours, um, and he shared with me some hardships that he had had when, um, because he had just moved from the Philippines. It was just really hard, and we chatted, and he came down from Fresno to say thank you which was really touching. And then he literally like drew, drove back to Fresno that day. It was like, what? You're driving, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I'm gonna drive back to Fresno now. It was really heartwarming. Um, and then in the middle, so that's Jacob. And I actually just talked to his dad yesterday. He got a full scholarship to UCSB. And um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and his dad actually, um, he works as a custodian at our school. He's kind of a floater, so he goes around to lots of different schools. So he was at our school yesterday. I said, hey, how's Jacob? And he was telling me, oh, his mom is crying every day because he's at school. But UCSB is like literally like, I, I mean, it's like literally like five minutes away from our campus. <laughs> <laughs> and he's coming home every day to get more stuff for his dorm room. And we were just laughing about that. But Jacob was in my third grade class. And, um, and I joked and I said, well, he can come back to visit me when he gets his college acceptance. And I was joking about it, but he did. He came back and he visited me um, to let me know that he got a full scholarship to UCSB. 
And then this is Silverio, and he was in my first grade class, and this is in his backyard. His family lives out at the La Patera Ranch, which is just right across from La Patera School. And, um, and I just, uh, I just remember Silverio so vividly. Um, I, I remember one time he fell asleep in class. <laughs> and he must have been so tired. So I just let him sleep, take a nap there until he was ready to wake up. And so this is how I know everything is going to be okay, because during the pandemic, he graduated from Long Beach State. This is his graduation party. Um, and he graduated from Long Beach State, and he also got his EMT license. So he was working as a paramedic, and he is also going to go to medical school, or he wants to go to medical school. That's his next step. So, um, so that's how I know that everything is going to be okay. Um, but it does help to do, for me, it helps me to do my personal mindfulness awareness practice. It, it's helpful for me to be um, physically active. Um, and it's also helpful for me to be around people who are also taking care of themselves. And so some of the takeaways I have, like I loved Suzanne's final slide where it said, take care of yourself first. Um, where's Suzanne? Oh, take care of yourself first, which is true. It's not selfish because when you do that, you can then take care of the people around you more wholeheartedly. And I also liked Kara's slide where it said, um, be yourself and don't complain and don't whine. You know, we can we all have those thoughts because we're human beings. But the thing is, is that we have the power to change those thoughts into something more positive. And if I can do it, then anybody can do it. So I promise you, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Okay, so thank you so much. And it was great being here. Thank you so much, ladies. That was so fantastic to learn more about your program and what you're doing, especially from a district level. That is just such powerful stuff. I love that it's part of the day. It's just part of what we do and modeling that behavior for students. Gloria, thank you so much for stepping out of your class today. We appreciate you so much for doing that. And you know what? Those kids are going to be okay. They're going to be great. They're going to be ready to go for you tomorrow. And everything is figure outable. Devinder and I both are taking that away. That is. Yeah, and we're going to put it in our jolly topia. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Team Galita, so very much.